pray together. Father, we're thankful for this time. We thank you, Father, for the, uh, the possibility that you afford us to, to learn, uh, to share. And Father, more than that, we thank you for the possibility and the probability of leading someone to Jesus. And we thank you for it. I thank you for every person that's in this room tonight, Father. And I pray that you speak to our hearts, both through the, the, the taught word and the, uh, the sharing with each other, uh, the testimonies, uh, and I thank you for it. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, Psalms 126.5 is uh, so tears 
uh, a series of so tears, or so tears, and uh, reap joy. And then Romans uh, three twenty three is for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans six twenty three is uh, for the, the gift. Uh, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody quote Romans 5 8. Yeah, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Revelation 3 20. Revelation 3 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and man hear my voice and open the door. I will fellowship with him, and he was me. Okay. First John five thirteen, somebody. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. After you heard me. What? Of truth, the word of truth. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and and you believed. You were what? Sealed. Sealed with the, the Holy Spirit, Spirit promise, who is the earnest of our inheritance. In other words, he's the down payment God made, assuring us that we have salvation. I made a statement this morning, and I think I may have made it here before. You got to get a person lost before you can get them saved. <laughs> you know, they've got to realize they're lost before they're going to ever get saved. You know? And uh, so uh, I, I convinced Shirley that I loved her before she ever married me, <laughs> right? And uh, so, so we, we all had a good question this morning. Uh, one of our church families had a good question this morning. I think it's a privilege of this. What if your person of memorization is not easy? Then what do you do? What if the person what if, what if memorizing things is not easy? But for some people, memorization is not easy. Right. Like some preachers can preach a whole sermon. I use manuscript right. because memorization is not easy for me. Now, these scriptures are, right. but I've used them for 60 years. Right. It's a whole different deal, you know. Amen. So what, do you, what do you say? They become a part of it. That's why we do the packet. You've always got to Yeah, but let me tell you, just, I thought about that. Yeah. We've always but this, is a, this is cumbersome to carry with you. I have an answer. I just wonder what your answer was. Well, whoops. <laughs> I haven't really thought about that. He's <laughs> painting you into a corner. I'm oh, sorry. I think he's painting no, you. No, I don't mean to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. Because that is a. And also, because, you know, when you begin to share with somebody, I don't care how long many times you've done this, you've done as much as you have, there's all, you're a little nervous. Yeah. And so. Being comfortable, one thing, I'm, I'm going to just say what I'll share, and I'll let you go on. you got plenty to do. But that's why a Mark Bible is so good. That's and it. Read mm -hmm. the Word. The second thing is, I like tracks. And I know Richard's going to give us a track. Yeah. My answer to that is, if you're, if you're a lady, carry a track in your purse. If you're a guy, put one in your pocket. Because tracks really help. Plus, just like you said, give the Bible away. Man, you can hand a track away, and I, and I, and I, and I, I needed a track on Friday because right. I was witnessing with a guy, and I would love to let the track with him. And I thought about that, but I didn't have one to give. And uh, but tracks would be that. That was my answer. I, but I'm, I'm serious. That's a, that is going to be an issue with folks, right. you know, with memorization. You know, right. I, I, I'm just saying. Well, I, I, I would. I would agree with that, and I will confess in front of all of you that I absolutely can't memorize things and, and retain them for any length of time unless I use them on almost a daily basis. Right. Yeah. Names I'm terrible with. See, when I when I first got saved, uh, about six weeks into my salvation, I was I entered into a to a training where we were given the little packet, and I, this is not new to me. It was, it was given to me, and I carried that little packet around till it wore out. And I have a hard time memorizing scripture also. But, but that's one reason that we give the packets. Uh, have you ever heard of the four spiritual laws? Uh, 
one of the finest there is. That's true. And it basically what we're teaching is the four, <coughs> the four spiritual laws. And uh, as Brother Bob said, if you can't memorize the scripture, you can really get yourself familiar with a track. Uh, Richard, didn't you say you had some tracks on? Yeah, we'll get them on Thursday. I'm sorry. We we'll get them on Thursday. Get them on Thursday. Okay, so we'll have them for you next Sunday. Thursday. And, uh, Thursday. I mean Thursday. Thursday. Uh, now Thursday is the last day. Right. Four spirits. Four So, so if you do have a, if you do have a problem memorizing. Use the packet, you know, and, and, and like, like Brother Bob said to some of you, it may be cumbersome, but, but, but here's the other thing you can do. You can use that packet to go over it wherever you are, whenever you are, whether you're at home, uh, you're sitting watching television during the, during the commercials, so then read those things. Just read them over and over and over and over and over until you become familiar with them, okay? Um, so... Uh, and, and it's very important whether you use the packet or whether you use a track or whether you use a little New Testament. And, and really, basically, you don't have to really memorize the scripture, even if you use the New Testament. You get it out and you turn to the turn to the passage of scripture and say, "Look, uh, uh, look, Bob, here it is, right here," and, and you read it to them, and you let them see it. You know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But it's very important that they see the scripture that you're either reading or quoting. You know, and and for those of you that can memorize, I always turn my Bible around when I'm witnessing to someone and just show them right there. You you read it as I quote it. You see, and and so so. I'm glad you brought that up, Paul. Really, you know, because I never really thought about uh, somebody having a hard time, but but they do. I do. And I never, never really thought about it. So, so anyway, the track to run on is you get comfortable. What is a transitional sentence? I always use a transitional sentence from from going uh, from that picture on the wall to get myself uh, on common ground with that person. To a transitional sentence is something, and again, you have to personalize it. Don't use something that, that I've told you. Don't use something that somebody else has told you. It has to be your own. For me, it's something like, you know, uh, David, we've, we've talked, and, and I know I've come here, and I've, I've known you a short while, but I come here not only to just visit with you personally and get to know you a little better, I come here for a greater purpose. And that is to share uh, my love of God with you. Would you mind if I if I share with you just for a moment? Go for it. See? Uh, and then and then it's that's a transitional sentence. It transitionalizes from from the earthly to the spiritual. Okay. And immediately the first the first spiritual law is what? God loves them. God loves us. You see that the first, the first thing, the first rattle out of the bag is you you establish God's love to them. Okay, and that's found in, of course, John three sixteen. Anybody here care to quote John three sixteen? <laughs> See, you can memorize. <laughs> but you used it. But that's why he says he was five. <laughs> yeah, for, for 60 years. years. And, and, and you say, you know, that's a great big love, isn't it? Uh, you know? And, and then you just ask them, uh, do you realize how much God loves you? And then you establish their need. And it's very important at this point that you say, that you make a make a very strong point that Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's not the sin of murder, burglary, thievery, adultery, drinking, drugs, or whatever. You see. Now here's the, here's the whole point with that. 
so many times the outside world, most people out there, think the, the ones that think they're lost, they have a, a concept of God, they, they think because they are sinning, they're lost. And that's not it at all. They're lost, and the lostness causes them to sin. You see, we get, get backwards. We have a tendency to think, think sins cause us to be lost. That's not it at all. We're lost, and it causes us to sin. It, it, does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. And so, so I make a very strong point in, in Romans 3.23. This is a very, very cutting edge here that you need to establish lostness, the sin of unbelief. That's what it's talking about. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is unbelief. The first, the first point that's made in John chapter 16, verse 7 is the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will convict the world of sin because they believe not in Me. That's the sin that we're talking about. The sin of separation. And then Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death. Richard, you work a week on doing contract work and you expect to earn a wage, don't you? Right. And that wage is what you earn for working during that week. You say, well, God says in His Word, that the ways that you can expect to earn at the end of this life is death without Jesus. But it also says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, so at this point, be sure to establish losses and and man's need to be. And then, then very quickly from from that point. You know, and they'll they'll begin to give you little hints along the way as to what they're feeling and what they're responding to. So uh, the next point I, I make is establish man's response, what he is to do. Romans ten, read somebody read Romans ten nine and ten for us. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confesses, confession is made unto salvation. Amen. And then, and, and then, uh, Romans 10, 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, that's a great big promise. Mm -hmm. That if, if you respond, to God's love and your need, you shall be what? Saved. Saved. You shall be born again. And then after that, uh, after the response, your, your need to respond. You know, and along the way, uh, it, especially after the, the, the need to respond, man's response, you can ask that person at that point, if they, if they would like to receive Christ as a personal Savior. Okay? And then and, and then uh, go on, and then after after that, after they respond, you, uh, you use, a, use a sentence like this, would you like to receive Christ right now? Would you like to confess your sin of separation and receive Christ as your personal Savior? And if they respond yes, then you do what? Pray the prayer. Prayer again. Now, I always say this, you know, and, and, I, and I, this is just me. I always say to a person, if I'm witnessing to them, I say to them, you know, and, and they told me that they want to be saved, they want to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. I say to them, let's, I said, do you, do you know how to pray? They usually say, no, I don't, I don't know how to pray. And then I say, well, let me lead you in a prayer. And, and, and Ricky, when you're praying this prayer, if I come to a place, I, I want you to repeat that to me. Not, not pray it to me, but pray to God. 
But if I come to a place in this prayer that you honestly, with all your heart, cannot say, then don't say it. And we'll go from there. We'll, we'll talk about that further if you can't pray. But I want you to be earnest, and I want you to be honest with yourself and with God in this prayer. And then I just say, let's pray together. I want you to repeat the prayer. And if you can't say it, if you can't repeat the prayer in your own heart, then don't do it. Okay? You're not driving away from something at all when you, when you do that. At this point, they're usually, you, you can usually tell, especially after you've witnessed a time or two, you can usually tell. There, there's one or two reasons why a person does not get saved in a personal witness. Number one is you haven't answered all their questions about salvation. Number two is the Holy Spirit is not drawing them. You know, the Holy Spirit had they haven't given the Holy Spirit time. And it may be that you may have to come back later. You always want to leave the door open. Okay? And so then, let's assume they've prayed the prayer of salvation. Then, then you go uh, and show them the assurance passages of Scripture. 1 John 5, 13. These things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And then uh, just explain to them what took place. And again, show them the scripture. I think one of the greatest scriptures in all of the Bible is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, as to what happens to a person when they get saved. Rhonda, would you like to read that passage? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. In him you also have trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed in you, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to, to the praise of his glory. Amen. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. You see, every person in this room that's saved didn't get saved out of thin air. You heard the word, didn't you? Somebody told you. Either either mother, daddy, grandmother, grandparents, or a preacher in the pulpit, or a personal witness told you and you heard the gospel of your salvation, and then you trusted him. Then, what happened? You were sealed. And that word sealed means marked. You were marked by the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to us in, in some other form. He comes to us in that salvation. He seals us in salvation. You get every ounce of the Holy Spirit that you're going to ever get the moment you're saved. Mm -hmm. The problem is he don't get all of us. You see. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> we're going to deal a little bit later. Richard's going to come out. We're going to deal a little bit later. I've got a little acrostic that I want to give you. Uh, but I want to share with you that in, in, a, in, another, in another moment. Okay? Well, Miles really wants to do is start the program and end the program. <laughs> <laughs> That's what senior pastors do. <laughs> <laughs> the last word, I was kidding about that, but I got one more thing. And I said, as long as you're done by seven, because I heard you this morning, you're saying they're really good about the time. I know that. You're right. <laughs> I know. Don't make us liars now. I just want to, for those that weren't here um, last time, I'm going to give you uh, some of the stats uh, on um, why people attend church. And this is done by Pew Research. And, um, and why people attend church through advertisement, 2% do organized visits, 6% invite invite from a pastor, 6%, but invite from a friend is 86%. That's why it's really important that we become a, a witness. 
And then I did a little bit more research, and I can share a story from what happened to me today about witnessing. And uh, this also comes from uh, Pew Research. Now, this was done before COVID, so take it for what it is. But uh, this is for those who attend church that are believers, right? And why they attend church. Okay, so, and they have to attend at least twice a month. And the number one reason is they want to become closer to God. The second reason is very close to the first reason. They want their children to have moral foundation. The third reason, to make me a better person. And the fourth reason, comfort in times of trouble and sorrow. Now these are um, believers who say this is why they do not attend church. Um, the number one is I practice my faith in other ways. Number two, they just profess, I mean, I'm not a believer. And number three, they haven't found a church or a house of worship that they like. This is just food for thought. I just want to give you this last one I found. For those that said I practice my faith in other ways, we've all heard that. I've heard that. Like, I can worship God in the deer stand. You know, I can worship on the tractor. I can, you know, I don't need to go to church. You all heard that. Right? Everyone's on their head. You probably have said that time too. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay. And so they broke that down. For those people that said I practice my faith in other ways as a believer, and this is the reason why they practice their faith in other ways. The number one reason was they did not like the congregation or the religious services. Number two was, I haven't found a church or house of worship that I like. The third one, which is actually pretty low, it's only 18%. I don't like the sermons, so guys, you're good. Anyway. And, the, and the last one, 14%, was just, I don't feel welcomed. And, and so that was one of the reasons. And uh, another one, so far as, then they asked them about logistically, you know, as far as where you live and the you know, commute and all that, so forth. The number one reason was, I don't have the time. We've all heard that. Another reason I have uh, poor health, difficult at getting around, which is justifiable. And the last one is there isn't a church for my religion in that area. So those are just some fun facts to kind of ponder on. And then I'm going to go, we're going to go back to what we did last time. We'll hear three of y'all's testimonies. We're going to kind of break that down. But as I, as I shared with you last time, in my sermon, just about 100% of the time, I give my personal testimony. And I did it again this morning when I was at Spicewood Baptist Church. I was sharing my testimony at the very end of the service. Mm -hmm. You know, I used uh, Psalms 10, 13, you know, call the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And so I share that real quickly. I do my elevator, boom, like I told you, my 20th floor, ser my sermonette of my salvation. And I shared that and after the service. And a lady came up to me in tears. And she just goes, I want to be able to tell my story like you just told yours. And she goes, I just can't seem to do it. And I want to make sure my kids and my grandkids are saved. And so she went on to tell me her story. And so the word I came up with was hers was she's, she was sad until she came to Christ. So the one word for hers was sad. But then she worried about her kids and her grandkids. She goes, I know they go to church. They're active, but I don't know if they're saved. And I, 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 sometimes I ask them, you know, are you sure you're saved? They, she goes, I want to be convinced by them. That's what say, so I feel good about myself. And so what I told her was, I said, because apparently she's not getting the response that she wants from her kids and the grandkids that convinces her that they're saved. And I said, my response was, I said, you don't need to worry about that. You need to convince them that you're saved. Tell your story and keep telling it often. And so they can, through that testimony, you'll know if they're a child of God or not because they'll be developed that same story. And if they can't come up with that time and that moment and that word that changed their life, then that, that will give you that assurance, or maybe you need to continue to be that witness. But I said, just continue to tell your story. So we've got to talk about that a little bit. And we had two other people on the way out said, I want to be able to do that too. So I'm kind of a little training right there. And we went through that process and once again before I left this morning. But that is a common thing that I see um, from any believer. They, they, they want to know, how do I know they're really saved? You know, how do I know they're a child of God? And... Uh, and that's not our responsibility, truly. If someone calls upon the name of the Lord, they're a child of God. As I told you about that young man that came forward, you know, I didn't do the, the sinner's prayer because he said, right there with, in the pew with his mom, he said, I, I, I called upon Jesus the same man. I did what you did. And he, and he used that same scripture. So I went through the plan of salvation real quick with him. I make sure he believed that died, Christ died for him, took his cross to Calvary. And rose from the grave or went through the plan of salvation real quickly. Then my prayer to him was said, let's pray and thank God for what he's done in your life. And he could say that prayer. He said, Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And then I just prayed over him, thank you, Lord, for saving him. 
<clears throat> so that, that, that was the way I, I do that. And just people have that confirmation I am a child of God because I did do what the scripture told me to do. I call upon his name. And so if you're worried about someone else in your family or someone that you know, are they saved or not, just keep telling your story. Yeah. Remind them how you came to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because this is the best story you can ever tell. And we all can tell our other stories over and over again. Plus, we have heard them, right? And you're right. People go, oh, remember that time I did this? Remember that time I did this? Yes, you told me a hundred times. Right? Well, I'd rather have someone say, yes, I know how you got saved. You told me. You know, and then say, well, tell me how you got saved. And let them tell you the same way. So anyway, that's just, I just want to give that to you. So let's do what we did last week. So who's prepared to share their testimony tonight? As if I'm a lost person, you're going to tell me how you got saved. He's ready to go. Good. Well, uh, I think I would begin by just saying um, that ever since I was a child, my mother had always told, talked to me about God, and so I always felt as though I knew God and Jesus. I just knew the whole um, the, the combination of the two. And, and um, as I got older, I I would pray and I continued to believe in what I understood um, I should believe in. And I knew from my mother um, what things were right and wrong. And then as I got older, of course, you begin to recognize those things in yourself. You're old enough that you that the Holy Spirit or part of God tells you, no, that's not right. And yes, this is. And um, I thought that was all that I needed. And then um, after I got married uh, and started going to an evangelical church, I heard something about um, accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior and about being baptized by immersion because I had been baptized as an infant. Um, and I thought, oh, I don't need that. You know, I've already been baptized. And so the day I went forward in that little church to join the church, the pastor said, oh, well, that means you're going to be baptized tonight. And uh, that took me back a little bit. And I went home and cried mm -hmm. and cried and cried because I didn't understand. I thought, I thought for sure they didn't understand that I had been baptized. And so I, I just was really having um, an argument in myself. And so that night at church, I immediately went into the um, baptismal pool and was baptized. And I realized when I was under the water that if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be coming out of the water. It, it just was a very real experience for me that uh, although baptism doesn't save me, it helped me to recognize what Jesus had done for me. And so from then on, I felt um, much better about my relationship with God. I had a couple of children, and then my husband went remote, and I was alone with my children. And I still thought I was saved, but one day I was sitting on the couch and looking out the window and I thought, Lord, why do I feel the way I do? Why don't I feel closer to you? And it was as though he visited me and said, just love me. Just love me and give me your life and you will feel closer to me. And that was it. That, that was the moment that I remember distinctly, still, um, how many years later? Mm -hmm. 50 plus, almost 60 years later, <laughs> right. that, um, that that's when I was saved. That's when I really gave my life over to Jesus. And I feel that my life has been very different since then. I'm not perfect, but I know that when I ask God for help, solace, for um, companionship, sometimes just for a hug. Um, he's there, and he gives it to me. Yeah. And I love, love, love reading his word, 
And so I would want anybody that would choose to give their life to Jesus to want to stay in the Word and be close to Him. Amen. That's awesome. That's a great testimony. It is. So in that testimony, if we're riding up an elevator, okay, you got you got 20 floors and tell me how you came to know Christ. Oh, well, maybe I needed 30 floors. Yeah. <laughs> You have to hit the stop button. You have to hit the floor. I'm like a talker, stop. yeah. Press, accidentally press, it, press the stop button or something. No, what I'm trying to say is, so at the moment you just, yeah. so you're on this journey. It really looks, I mean, it's a journey of, of these, these seeds of salvation that were planted in your life until the mm -hmm. point you, you kind of ask the question, you know, Lord, how can I really be saved? As, Amen. as the scripture says, you know. And, uh, and, he, and he told you. So you're always seeking that uh, acceptance, mm -hmm. it sounds like. And so if I was going to use a word, I would probably use the word acceptance. Because because I'm because we're talking about, if you're telling someone who's lost, you know, we talked about last week, it was uh, control, control for you, uh, Donna was void, and, and Ricky's was fear, and mine's fear too, fear of hell. But yours was, um, mm -hmm. yeah, what did I just say? I just said, <laughs> someone tell me. Acceptance. Acceptance. I think you're, I'm sorry, I got a lot of things in my brain. I don't memorize well either. But, uh, <laughs> acceptance, that you're seeking that acceptance from God. And until you actually came to that point, God knocked on your heart's door, and he's probably been doing that, that you came like you invited him in. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of lost people have that same issue, they're looking for acceptance. Acceptance because you know your history. Because you know where you're coming from. You know what you've done, and, and you just can't move past that and right. think that um, a loving God would expect that, would accept you. Um, or Satan keeps a lot of people in prison. So what you, what you just said right there took like three floors. Exactly what you said. And, and it's a perfect Richard, testimony. It's a perfect testimony. I need a skyscraper. Okay. Oh, <laughs> no, you're good. You can do it on the escalator. That was awesome. What I'm saying is you're just talking about people being accept, you know, mm -hmm. looking for that acceptance. Mm -hmm. And the only way to truly, be, because of their history, because of their past, they don't think they can be accepted, especially by a loving God. But you can hear, and your story is like, yes, because he accepted me. And if he can accept me, he can accept you. Mm -hmm. And in a nutshell, that's your testimony. And then once I get to know you, you can take them all the way to skyscraper. But, in that, <laughs> but initially, you can just say, are you looking for acceptance? Because I was too. Until I reached out to God and he, he invited me in and I, and I allowed him to come in. Well, I think it's important too that we remember because you said yours was fear, Ricky's was fear, mm -hmm. mine's acceptance. That's why when we, when we actually try to witness to somebody uh, that some people aren't as receptive as others because they're not where we are. They're not looking for the same thing or, or maybe they're not filled with fear. Maybe they need that acceptance. And so they need to talk to somebody that had the fear. Possibly, but what I'm saying is, is that even though yours was acceptance, fear, void, and control, um, I think every believer, I think that was all my issues as well. Mm -hmm. But it was the fear that 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 was my greatest, I guess. But I think if someone that came to me and said, hey, you're missing that void, I think I'd have connected that as well. Someone acceptance, I think I'd have I went that as well. Okay. But the person that was witnessing to me, Connected on that, yeah, I had that fear too. But God's always going to, we talk about divine appointment, He's going to put someone on your path, and that's going to make that connection. Absolutely. So, yeah, so, and, and we're supposed to scatter the seeds freely wherever we go. And where they land, God takes care of the rest. I and mean, that's all we're called to do. But if I, but I, acceptance is one I would, if I was going to pictures in a nutshell, acceptance, that's what I was seeking. That's what you're seeking the whole time. And when we know we're headed towards somebody that we're going to try to share Jesus with, mm -hmm. we just need that two story prayer that says, Amen. Lord, you know, prepare their heart and, and give me story. the words to say. That's good. That's awesome. All right. Good deal. Nine point. Amen. All right. Who's next? That's awesome. Let me That's give you the other half of the story. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell her thing. <laughs> right. One of the greatest things that I've seen in my life is how God steps in at the right time and, and will guide you through life if you will let him. Sure. Because I've seen it. Uh, I accepted Christ when I was about 13. Well, I was 13. Memorial Baptist Church down in Killeen. Uh, I had four uncles. Two of them were members of that church. And they were strict. And they were my 
mentors. They were my, my father was an alcoholic. He and I didn't have a relation. It wasn't negative. It just wasn't there. Uh, my mother was primitive Baptist. He was Church of Christ. And so she made sure that I went to church. And I was Memorial Baptist Church is where I went. That's where two of my uncles were. Uh, I knew God was calling me. I, but I was fearful that if I stepped out in that aisle, the angels were going to sing, the room was going to light up, you know, what right. kids ha may have in mind. Sir? And I would literally sit there holding the back of that pew, not letting go of it, yeah. to make sure I didn't step out in that aisle until one night I just couldn't handle it anymore. I had to give in and, and give my turn my heart over it. So I did. I stepped out in that aisle. Uh, didn't make a huge difference in my life until I joined the Air Force at age 18. And we laugh about it, but that's when my dad quit drinking. Uh, that he just needed to get me out of the house, I used to tell myself. But at any rate, I joined the Air Force. Uh, first base I went to, and, and I blamed God for this initially, Massachusetts. This boy was raised in Texas, never been out of the state, except to Shreveport, Louisiana, and back one time. And here I'm going to this Yankee place. That you couldn't pronounce. That I couldn't pronounce. <laughs> Massachusetts, I got it now. <laughs> but at any rate, um, I was there for four years, uh, re-enlisted, 